me a little bit about who we are, what we do, why we do it, and then I'd really love to see whether we can talk a little bit about what kind of fakes um, you might come across and what you might do um, when you see them. Um, what you might do if you meet somebody who believes one of these fakes, you might be entirely immune to them, but maybe somebody that you know is not, and maybe you can help them um, figure it out. Um, so, um, Lie Detectors works currently with 200 journalists in three countries in Europe. And what we do is we, we train the journalists, we teach, we, we send them into classrooms, currently virtually, um, to talk to children aged 10 to 15 about disinformation, what it is, what do you call it, why it's there, why they should even care. That's an uh, increasingly more important thing to bring home to them, except now during the the corona crisis because all of a sudden people really do care and it's no longer just a political issue. Um, and we also talk about how journalism works because we really, you know, coming from a journalist background, we want to make sure that people understand that there is such a thing as um, purposeful manipulation and disinformation on the one side and on the other hand, journalism that might always not always be entirely perfect but actually has the sort of the good faith um, attempt to inform. So we start with a kind of pretty grim worldview. That's what motivates us. We're quite pessimistic, which is what if people are not necessarily aware that there are, that there is you know, misinformation and disinformation and fake news floating around the online universe? And what if um, they don't know that there are things like fact-checking sites to help them along? Or what if, even if they do know that these fact-checking sites exist, that they don't believe what they find on these fact-checking sites um, or even if they do know that they exist and believe what they read what if the fact-checking sites cannot actually track everything that is circulating circulating online um, and what if the moderators the content moderators and the fact-checking armies that Facebook and YouTube put out into the world are not enough to delete our way out of this disinformation problem um, and then you know, I think we all know about um, uh, WikiLeaks and very big data dumps ahead of elections, but what if fake news also travels, and I'm using fake news, I shouldn't really, we normally call it disinformation. Um, what if it travels far more insidiously than that? What if it really doesn't only happen around election time, but actually just is a slow drip drip of disinformation that disconcerts people and hollows out their belief in regular democratic structures. And then by the time um, elections come along, the damage is already done. Um, and what if this kind of disinformation reaches people who are much younger than we thought, because we work with young people. Today I'm talking to you, but normally we work with young people. And what if their teachers um, and their parents are either completely unaware that they are receiving this disinformation and consuming and sharing it, or they might know but feel entirely unable and under-resourced to address this issue. And that sounds really terrible, but actually, <laughs> since we've been doing our work, since we started doing our work in 2017, it's kind of been borne out by, by development since then. So what we do is we, we send um, um, journalists into classrooms, and I'm going to see whether I can quickly show you what that looks like now. Normally, we, um, normally we do that... There we go. Normally we do that. Um, oh, no, I can't do it that way around. Give me two seconds. I need to first, I need to share my screen and then. No, just bear with me. There we go. There you are. So, uh, play from the current slide. So, normally we send journalists into classrooms properly and they're usually quaking in their feet and because they're not used to going and, uh, and talking to young people at all and also not giving themselves that kind of vulnerability to children saying, have you ever written fake news? Um, but they do do it amazingly and these days they're going, um, going into classrooms, they're being beamed into classrooms um, during the lockdown and during the, particularly during the partial and the weird hybrid educational format that many 
classrooms have here in Europe at the moment. So at the top, there's a journalist in Salzburg in, uh, in Austria with a class of 10 year olds. Uh, then next to that is Julia Kuttner, who is a public broadcast journalist in Hamburg in Germany with a classroom. And then at the bottom, very animated and obviously a YouTuber waiting to happen, um, a newspaper journalist from um, a Belgian newspaper called La Libre Belgique, also with a group of, of kids. And the amazing thing is that we found is that even in this really stressful time for teachers and educators, and we can talk about that later if you like, um, the interest in this has been enormous. And, um, you know, even these unbelievably stressed and overwhelmed teachers are inviting us in. Um, and the kids, I'm just going to show you a little bit of the feedback and then we're going to get on to our interactive session. The kids really get something out of it because it's an unusual method to learn because teaching them how to think critically about what they consume online is something that requires their own independent thinking rather than the vertical transmission of, 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 of learning from somebody who knows to somebody who doesn't know. So they're really being allowed to kind of um, go around the internet and find what they know. So um, the kids like it. And while we've been doing this, we've also found that teachers and parents like it um, and that they want to know as well. Um, and so we thought we only had something to say to the young people, but apparently we always have things to say to adults. And Simon thought so too. Um, and so now this is why I am here to talk to you about it. And I'm going to just unshare my screen you, You've made now. the point, sorry, you made the point that this is not just an incidental additional skill that kids need. It's actually the being able to taking lots of information and, and sort through it is the critical skill in the sort of modern era. Yes, look, I mean, um, we advocate, so we do this very practical work, but what we're really advocating for is to become unnecessary, right? We shouldn't be journalists going into classrooms. What should happen is that this should be integrated into all school curricula and all teachers should be able to do this. This should not be something that is relegated to the computer lesson or whatever. This should be something that every single teacher is capable of transmitting to the children. Check your sources, see whether it's true. Why not let a biology teacher talk about it? Look how relevant that is for the coronavirus now. Um, have the poli sci teacher talk about it. Literature, it's relevant. It's relevant. We've even been in mathematics lessons. Um, we also advocate for, I don't know how many of you are aware, um, that, that the OECD um, hands out something called PISA rankings. These are school rankings that certainly in Europe are incredibly prestigious because they allow uh, the regions of Europe to say, look what great graduates we have, and they attract um, business. They attract, you know, the next Amazon hub or whatever because they've got great graduates. And so they use these PISA rankings and and the amazing thing is that at, at the OECD there is a lot of thinking going on right now that the PISA rankings need to be rewritten entirely and what we need to be measuring when we think about what kind of skills children leave school with is not just the basic literacy of reading and writing and counting I think that's what they do in counting that includes science scientific uh, 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 literacy but also this digital literacy this ability to the OECD they call it multi-source literacy other people call it lateral literacy it's really this ability to look left and look right before proceeding forward and the OECD calls it the triangulating and assessing of information and subsequent building of knowledge, which actually, as Simon and Pamela will probably testify, is what we journalists do every day. That's what we do. We build knowledge every day. So in, a, in an amazing twist of fate, we're actually a, quite apparently quite a good group to be talking about this with the kids. So, but first of all, actually, is that, does that answer your question? Okay, great. Um, um, so first, I actually wanted to know from you out there, where on social media you go to get your news? On social media, I'm not talking about, you know, the TV or the radio, but actually when you're on, on social media and online, where do you go to get your news? So if you can go into... Participants. If you click on participants and Juliana will ask you about certain platforms and you can answer yes, the, the green tick or no, the red cross. Exactly. So give me a, a yes or a no. Give me a yes or a no if you are on Facebook. If you go and get information, if you regularly receive information about what's going on on Facebook. So you can choose between the red or the green. Where do I see it? Um, if you, 
It, it seems that we're a fair mix. Um, let's see, I'm clicking all the way down. It seems to be about 50-50 if you, if you go to participants. I see it. I and, see it. Uh, scroll all the way down. It seems to be about oh. half and half. Okay. So um, that's Facebook. How about Twitter? Again, you can click yes or no. About 23 yes and 48 no. Okay. Oh, yes, I how forgot that was a counter. Yeah. How about WhatsApp? Is it WhatsApp for news or just WhatsApp for phones? Yeah. What's your question? No, for, you, know, where you, where you, get, you know, how often do you, you know, if you, if you regularly get information from WhatsApp that you go, oh, I didn't know that, now I know it, and you've got it from WhatsApp, then say yes. 60 no and 11 <clears throat> yes. Okay. I'm gonna, there's a couple more. Okay, I've got six more. Are you ready? So I'm going to do these quickly. So what about YouTube? Okay, a few more. All right. Um, Instagram? Okay. Snapchat? Now we're down to three who say yes. Okay. One, Snapchat one, is not yes. big in our demographic. <laughs> TikTok? I'm relieved we have two TikTok users. All right. Twitch? Twitch is a video games platform, I believe, where you watch other people playing video games. I myself have not experienced it, and nor it seems of almost any of you. Yeah. And what about Fortnite? Definitely not me. Okay, very good. And I, I would imagine, Leo, I don't know whether you're, whether you're voting, but perhaps you are one of the two for, for, for a Twitch and Fortnite. So I am going to show you, this is very interesting, right? So um, it's interesting for various reasons, because first of all, you are navigating a universe that is entirely different to young people, young people. Let's just call them that. Hold on a second. I'm going to show you. Um, this is from a presentation from a uh, report that we did. So, uh, play from current slide. Here we go. So, um, can you see that? Can you see the, the graphic? I'm just going to show you very briefly. Yes, I think can. this is really, really fascinating and it really goes to the heart of why teachers, why less than 40% of teachers, even though 80% of teachers know that this is an important issue, less than 40% have actually addressed it in the classroom because they just don't dare. Because look, this is... Um, the, the pink is the teachers, right? The adults, let's say, and the, the turquoise is the kids, right? So they're getting their information very visually from YouTube, also from WhatsApp, from Instagram, from Snapchat, from TikTok, and really not very much at all from Twitter or from Facebook, which were your favorite platforms, you know, and that's also um, up here as well. So, um, and it's also interesting for another reason, um, and that is that these, hang on, let's stop sharing, that these platforms aren't actually, a lot of these platforms aren't actually moderated, right? Facebook and Twitter have got armies of moderators on there, deleting things and tagging suspicious content. But on WhatsApp, you're on your own. Um, where else were you? You said on YouTube. YouTube does have moderators, but it's very easy to con the system. Um, Snapchat, all of these places are, extremely difficult. It's what Mark Zuckerberg calls the digital living room. You're on your own in your living room and good luck to you. And so no one's going to come and, and hold your hand and tell you what's right or wrong, which is why um, it's a good idea for you to know what you're doing. <laughs> and I'm sure you do, but maybe others don't. So um, I'm going to show you a couple of, uh, of stories and I would like for you to vote whether you think they are true or not, okay? And then afterwards, what we'll do afterwards is we'll go through them and you can even nominate if you think that, if, if there's like a firm favorite or if Simon or Pamela think that we should focus on one in particular, um, then we can unravel them one by one. I'm ready to unravel all of them. I have a little checklist here that I'm about to show you to, for how to do it, okay? And then I'm gonna get you to say which one of these tools, it's a tool box, I'm gonna show it to you in a minute, um, which one you want to use and then we'll go through them. So, uh, share screen. Um, this one, I'm going to start with an easy one. This is quite an old one. Um, this appeared in 2016 and showed how Pope Francis um, 
uh, endorsed Trump for uh, for the elections. Um, and he said, I can't scroll down here because it's a PowerPoint presentation, but he said, I'm not trying to say this on behalf of the Vatican, but I really do on balance believe that Donald Trump is the better candidate. Who here believes that that is um, true and who believes that it is false? Again, you go to participants and you click the red or the green uh, for true or false. That should work, yeah. Someone asked what the question is. Um, oh, the question, is it true? Oh, I'm so sorry. Is it true that the Pope endorsed Trump for president in 2016? Is it true he said you should be voting when you're going to the polls, you should be voting for Trump? Uh, we have By strong way, consensus that it's false. It's about 85, 86 false against two true at the moment. Okay. And in a classroom, by the way, we have to ask these days, everybody knows who Trump is, but you do have to say, does everybody know who the Pope is? And not everybody does. Um, so, okay, that's number one. Very good. You're right, by the way. Um, how about this one? Uh, this is a, a WhatsApp post that's been circulating and going viral. I'll show you later on in lots of different languages. Um, uh, it is a chain letter and chain letters are something that children in particular get a lot and you know, young people and adolescents like Leo, no doubt you've been getting chain letters, right? Are you, are you nodding? Yeah, you are nodding. It's one of those amazing things that we don't know anything about, just how prevalent the chain letters are. Um, this chain letter says that, um, you know, old Chinese medicine says that um, you can gargle with uh, garlic water and it will, uh, it will cure you of the corona, of, of COVID-19. So who believes that that is true? Uh, we're currently running one true against about 80 saying it's fake. Okay, very good. All right. How about this one? Um, this is this circulated um, uh, on Twitter just after Hurricane Harvey and shows that actually because the uh, streets were inundated with water, um, they uh, there were in fact there was like wildlife and uh, including including sharks on the motorway. Who believes that that's real and who does not? Very active voting going on. It's stabilizing at about 63 fake and 27 saying it's true. Okay, interesting. Good. Um, and then finally, when Trump went to Paris in 2017, uh, Macron and his wife took him and the first lady to dinner in the Eiffel Tower. And the story um, says that they racked up a bill of over a hundred thousand euros um i believe this was at the time of the the yellow vest protest so it sparked quite a lot of outrage who believes that's real and who believes that's fault i've got another picture here hold on where you can see the bill better we'll look at the bill we'll look at the bill in in, in detail later on as well Again, the best way to vote is you go, you click the tab participants, and then you'll see a red cross or a green tick, red for false, green for true. And it's about 75 false against 17 true right now. Can you say that again? How many? About 75 saying it's fake and 16 saying it's true. Okay. Okay, so... Um, Fine. Excellent. So what? Okay, fine. I'm not going to tell you. Um, I'm first, I'm going to show you the kind of checklist that we work with. And by the way, all of these fakes, I've not made these up, right? These have all been circulating a lot. All of these stories have been circulating um, a lot. You can see, so this is a, an online, this, uh, this, this online um, story is on something called Nordpress, which is in Belgium. And um, the, the, you know, the, the shark one is obviously on Twitter, um, then there's a WhatsApp one, and then there's also just a regular website news story. Um, I'm gonna show you the, the, the tools that you have to unravel these, and then, then you're going to choose whichever one you want to unravel first, and then we'll go from that. Hold on a second. So these are the tools that we use with the kids and the, and the teachers. And they're actually not, it's not rocket science. These are actually tools that come from the International Federation of Librarians Associations. And um, we've added one. So you want to consider the source. You want to say, you know, are these people actually reliable, the ones who've written this? 
uh, you want to read beyond the headline. You might want to ask yourself, who is this person? Do I know who the author is? Who is Simon Cooper anyway? Um, is anybody else reporting this? We are extremely lucky to be living in a part of the world where we can afford web browsers, so we can go and do a Google search without any problem, um, which not everybody can. You may want to consider the date, and we'll get to that in a minute, um, why that might be important. Uh, you may want to consider whether uh, there is satire involved. It's very easy to misunderstand satire. Um, this one is one of my very, very favorites, especially at this time of crisis. Consider your biases, not only believing, are you believing it because you want to believe it? Or perhaps in these days, are you believing it because you need to believe it? You need for it to be true. You may want to ask experts, which, what, which is what good journalists should do a lot. Um, and then this is one that we added does the photo correspond to the article or is the photo actually real or not? Where's the photo from? Can you do a reverse image search? And I'd really love to see if we can do a quick reverse image search with you because those are really fun to do. And you can find out a lot about, um, about the story from, from doing that. So, um, which one should we start with? Should we do them in order? What should we do? Let's we do Macron. Start with, should you want to do Macron? You want to do Macron first? Sure. You do? Okay, good, fine. But I do really, okay, but we have to do the shark, okay? We're gonna have to do the shark. So hold on, let me, where do I do Macron? Macron, I'm gonna do online. Yeah, Macron, I'm doing, gonna do online. So, um, stop share because I need to reshare and show you my. Desktop. While Juliana's doing this, I witnessed the children in a class in Brussels. Keep going doing your search, Juliana. Uh, yeah. trying to decide whether the Macron-Trump dinner was fake or true. It was fascinating to see. What surprised the children most was that some people liked Trump. They had not considered that a possibility that there were people who supported Trump. Here yeah, we are. They, were, they were very interested. Can you see it? Are you seeing this? Are you seeing we everything seeing else it, on my yeah. desktop or are you only seeing, this is okay. We're right? seeing the bill of the dinner and we're seeing them sitting in the Eiffel Tower, yes. Okay, so here it is in English, in, in French and for simplicity's sake, um, it has actually been translated. Um, so here it is in English with a slight typo right here. Um, and here's the story and I'm going to, oh, up, 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 up. Here it is. Um, here's the bill, 154,953 euros, which I don't know how many dollars that is, but it's a lot. Um, so how would you go about figuring out whether this is true or not. So you've got the, you've got the list. I'm going to just, you know, you want to check the source. Do you want to read beyond the headline? Do you want to know who the author is? Do you want to look at other sources? Is it a joke? What would you, what would you like to do to figure this out? Which one would you use? Well, I would say, what, what is this website? I've never seen this site before. Yeah, very good. Very good question. So hold on. Uh, all right. So contact so this is called not press okay and you might recognize it if you live in europe because there's something called sud press in belgium and sud press is um a the owner they're a little bit like a perhaps like um news corp they own an awful lot of tabloids in belgium and they are very active particularly in the rural parts of belgium um and they're not always very good right so somebody as a um as an answer to Sud Press, founded something called North Press. So perhaps this is actually the good counterpart to, um, to Sud Press. But why don't we have a look? So exactly, what is what is North Press? Okay, and sure enough, here's a Wikipedia entry. Would you like me to open it? You can um, see already, and even without speaking an awful lot of um, French, you might be able to say say that this is a parody information site in Belgium and what it is doing is it is parodying Sud Press because it is saying that Sud Press the journalists of Sud Press are so terrible that they'll make up anything so not press makes it its business to make up crazy stories and show in a parody fashion how bad bad journalism can be and bad journalism can be pretty bad that's true so um that's actually there you go there's your answer um however hold on when the you could also look at it. How, what other ways could you look at it? 
And that's by the way, does that convince you? Well, is anybody are, not, is anybody not convinced by that? Um, people were convinced before that it was a fake by the voting. Uh, Wolf Altman says um, the champagne, and Barry Russell says the champagne is the bulk of the, the bill. That seems improbable. Um, it's Trump doesn't drink alcohol. Uh, the context, uh, Anne Swardson says, with the Elise have received a bill that looks like that. So people mm -hmm. are pointing to other ways in which you could spot fakeness. Exactly. And you might also be able to point out that, you know, might, you might spot um, that there's also 14 um, baseball caps, presumably red ones that were on that bill. And obviously the Eiffel Tower probably doesn't sell baseball caps. So it's a joke. Um, and nonetheless, this joke made its way around and caused unbelievable um, ruckus in, in, uh, in, you know, in the French speaking part of, of Yeah, of Juliana, I wanted to say, you say it's a parody website and it's a joke, but in a lot of the fake news world, there's a kind of deniability of using so-called jokes to spread information, to spread disinformation. So it's a joke, but it's also disinformation, surely. Yes, of course. Yes, it's disinformation, absolutely. And when we go into classrooms, we often um, ask, um, you know, the young people, why, and the students, you know, why, you know, what is it? They'll often say, it's a joke. Well, it's a joke, isn't it? And then we'll say, well, why would you, why would you care? And actually, when you follow this back, um, for instance, I'm just going to go and unravel. Oh, there we go. I'm going to unravel this one. Um, this one, you are all right, is also a joke. Look at this. If you go to the about, this is again, just like Simon said at the first one, what is not press? Well, what is WTOE5 News, your local news now? You go on to about. Oh, please work. I hope it's going to work. It's well, tell loading. us what you, what you found last time you clicked about. Here it we says, go. there you go. Contact us at fantasynewswebsite at gmail.com. WTOE5 News is a fantasy news website. Most articles on WTOE5news.com are satire and pure fantasy. And the thing is, this was picked up and people didn't go back to the original source. This was, believe it or not, shared hundreds of thousands of times on Facebook, on Twitter, you know, on, on all of these social media um, platforms. This site here was long taken down and closed down while these while this rumor was still going around and was being taken for um for for you know for serious news so yes simon you're absolutely right of course it parades and this is why even a joke and this is one of the things that we do in the classroom we try to use in fact we try not to use political examples we try to use very um easy and kind of uh, accessible examples like the man who married the snake in malaysia or whatever to actually make relevant to the people that we're talking to, why would it matter? Even if it's just a joke, why would that matter? I mean, here it's obvious because it ferments political unrest and, and actually, you know, skews political decision-making mm -hmm. and the democratic process. Uh, Julia, and, and helped in the election because in 2016, also people were less aware of fake news, were less aware that something they saw might be fake. Juliana, tell us about the shark, please. Okay, so the shark, uh, where am I gonna start on the shark? Okay. This is the shark in Houston. Uh, let me show it to you. Okay, here's the shark. Okay. Uh, do you notice anything about that? I've just pulled it up online. Can you see it? You can all see it? Okay, good. What, do you notice anything about that versus the one that I just showed you? No. No? Well, I think the last one said um, Hurricane Sandy, didn't it? And this one says Houston. And I think the last one was shared 12,000 times and this one's shared 12 times. So what would you do? There's something strange about this, right? Or maybe just maybe it just happens to be, or maybe I'm wrong, I don't know. Maybe, what would you do to unravel this? Well, I'd want to know where that photograph comes from, but I would have no idea how to go and find out. Okay, so we can do a reverse image search. By the way, I hope this is not too school-like for you, right? But I quite like having this thing here behind me. Um, so reverse image search is something that's really, really um, great to do. And I'm going to show you how to do it, okay? And in fact, if you want to, you can do it right now yourselves if you know how to take a screen grab. For those of you who do know how to take a screen grab, which is to take a photo of a part of your screen, um, on my, I'm just going to do it right now. So I'm taking a photo of this. 
and then I will either go to uh, Google or today I'm going to go on to TinEye, which is a, a tool that, hel ooh, that helps you, hold on, TinEye.com, which helps you do reverse image searches. Okay, so there it is. And it's super easy. All you have to do is once you've got your screenshot of a photo where you're not entirely sure whether it's kosher or not, you click on this upload button. You go onto your screenshot, you upload it, you wait a little bit. And there you go. So this photo um, has been, appears in 965 different places. Um, and I've already sorted it by oldest because I did this earlier today to test whether it would work. Um, if you sort it by the oldest, <clears throat> you see that it was shared in 2011 and again in 2012 and again in 2013. In fact, when you look at it, you will see that this picture of this shark pops up wherever there is a natural catastrophe, whenever. And in fact, even now, there is a a, um, a coronavirus fake going around with exactly the same shark saying, isn't it amazing? Because nobody's you know, traveling anymore, the waters are so clear that you can see the sharks swimming in the water. Um, and they keep, you know, the, the thing, this is once again proof that it, you don't have to be a rocket scientist to, un, you know, to unveil a lot of these fakes, right? A lot of people who put fakes out there are not terribly, I mean, some of them are, but some of them, many of them are also just use the tried and tested thing and it creates outrage again and again. And the amazing thing is, is when you, when you look far enough, then you'll actually find out where the shark actually came from. Um, and I'm going to show you where the shark came from. This shark was first photographed in 2002 by a National Geographic photographer who took the pho perfect photo of a great white shark um, and I don't remember where it was. But um, there are actually people um, working for organizations like We Verify or You Check um, or Invid who will go to enormous um, lengths. These are the fact checkers doing the work for you. Um, they will actually go and measure whether this is the same shark. And they will measure all of the proportions and then they'll go back. Let's see if I can find it. Uh, where was it? Uh there see it's the same shark can you see that yeah. so there you go and the kids really love um doing the reverse image search. i myself um i'm a little bit skeptical because this doesn't it can't actually solve everything there's also something called google uh, i'm just going to google and you can do i don't even oh yeah if you want to do a google image search you go up here can you see that mm -hmm. up there on the top right and you turn your normal Google search into an image search, okay? And then you can either search, um, yeah, there you go. And then you can again upload, right? So you would, here I would do exactly the same, upload an image, choose file. I have my daughter knocking on the, <laughs> on the window, hold on. Okay, there you go. Um, and this again, and the nice thing about doing it on YouTube is that you get more than the photo. You'll actually also get Snopes, which is a wonderful, Frida, okay. Um, you get, I have a four-year-old who gets very impatient sometimes. Um, this is Zoom, at least uh, it's not like that man in Korea where she comes in <laughs> during live TV. Don't yeah, worry. It's not true. Um, so you get, you can see Snopes here, which is a very good fact checking site. I hope you know about it. They're really, really good. Um, then obviously Buzzfeed, um, they're reliable enough. Um, but you could also, rather than actually just rely on your, you know, on your funky reverse image search, you could also just type in again, you know, are there sharks swimming through the, you know, it's just, once again, I don't know if you even need me to do it. If you do it, you'll, want, you'll see a million entries saying no, because there's a huge industry of fact checkers trying to stop people consuming this stuff. Frida, sweetheart. No, no, darling. Okay. You're going to um, come to questions in a moment, by the way, okay. and I just put up an appeal on chat. Okay. For, um, questions, but keep going. Uh, the shark, the WhatsApp, does anybody want to have a look at the WhatsApp message. The WhatsApp message, as much as you might have scoffed at it, I'm going to stop sharing, as much as, much as you might have scoffed at it, 
um, the the WhatsApp message about the Chinese about the Chinese medicine of of, uh, of of garlic water was so popular that the WHO has had to issue a poster campaign um, to dispel this myth. Um, and you know there are parts of the world where these posters are actually like plastered over schools or wherever it might be because people really do believe this and that again is you might believe it because you really need to believe it because the reality might actually be too terrifying to contemplate um, and that's the thing about disinformation that it actually the reason why it's so um, so catchy and so tempting is that it pre often presents a very simple solution to very very complicated problems um, let me yeah, have a look I have a, a quite, just break in with a question for you what about a, a TV channel that we're very familiar with in the US, Fox News, which seems to do just sort of full-time disinformation? What do you do about a channel like that? About, about something like Fox News, did you say? Yeah. Yeah, well, so um, we choose our journalists very carefully. Um, and um, we would not ever, for instance, work with somebody from Fox News. Um, and we choose them on the basis of how reliable um, the, 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 their news outlet is, but also whether they are able to see and talk about their own news outlet with a critical eye. Because the, the truth of it is, is that we journalists, and I, you know, I'm, I'm a former journalist, as you can see from, um, you know, from the ad for today. Um, but you know, when I was a journalist, I got things wrong. I'm sure that Simon has got things wrong, you know, things are complicated, right? I mean, I, you know, I'm, I'm proud to say that I probably got like less than one in a hundred stories wrong, but I did get one in a hundred stories wrong, right? Mm -hmm. um, and the thing is journalists need to be able to talk about that and they have to. And in fact, the journalists that go into classrooms with us, they have to, as part of the script um, and, and we train them, actually say, look, I, I don't get it. I don't always get it right and why and then they talk about the you know what's mm -hmm. what's going on with journalism and then um because what we believe is it's really important to, f to point out the frailties of journalism in order for to not build us into a glass house because if we do that if we insist on being infallible then we fail at the first at the first That's error really however yeah, the, the, the question is a little bit different i think it's how do you prepare people to question sources ranging from say fox news which most of us would agree is not very reliable to you know the august financial times which i think is more reliable how do you approach those sources with skepticism but without also believing it's all made up it's all lies it's all nonsense by um equipping people with exactly these tools that's it if you have a friend who watches Fox News, what would you tell them to look out for? I would tell them to look out for their own bias. I would look out for, I would look out for these. They're so simple. They are so simple. But are you only believing Fox News? And if you do only believe Fox News, why is that? I mean, you know, everybody can form an opinion. That's okay. Anybody can form an opinion and we're, we would never ever tell people what to think. We would only tell people to think. And that's what, that's what we would tell people who watch Fox News. Think about it. Why do you want to believe this? There's some extremely interesting research by somebody called Stephen Lewandowski at Bristol University who um, talks about the benefits of pre-bunking versus debunking. That's a really technical term for basically he's talking about inoculating people against disinformation. And, and he's done scientific research where he's shown, and it's very recent scientific research where he's shown that people who um, are made aware of a character trait that they have and then are told that social media or a me or other media might actually target that particular character trait to capitalize on it to get their engagement to get their viewings if they know that then they are much more attuned to the fact that this might be happening and they are less susceptible to it it's really fascinating i encourage anyone to read that the other thing that's also a really interesting piece of research that i just came across today um, in the harvard misinformation review i think it's called again a piece of peer-reviewed um, scientific research that says that if you simply stopping and thinking even stopping to think reduces the chance of taking on board disinformation even Let's just the moment the moment of breathing and, and and letting the emotion wash over um, makes a difference, as our friend let's, Ian said. Let's turn this around. Uh, the New York Times, um, higher, much higher levels of factuality and liability, I would argue, but with, as conservatives always say, a clear, let's say, liberal bias. So conservatives will say, well, the New York Times is biased, therefore you can't believe it. 
Now, if the New York Times is doing a report on something, how would you approach that as a reader? What critical tools would you bring? And it's also a question for uh, the class. I would, I would look at the, okay, the New York Times, I would look at their track record. I would look at who the journalist is. I would compare sources. The New York Times has something really wonderful called, um, I've forgotten what it's called. They do a review, right, of the big news and they show how it's being covered by uh, the, you know, the more liberal press and the centrist and the more right-wing press and they do that and that way they are already peer reviewing and giving credence to people with other political aspects right and they're giving they're actually um allowing other interpretations to exist which is exactly what's necessary right but um i would i would look at how other newspapers are covering this and maybe i would perhaps you know given that i live here in europe i would look at how other parts of the world are um are covering it um and, you know, I would also allow for the fact that, yes, the New York Times does have a particular interest, for instance, in the city of New York, you know, or um, that's the most obvious thing, right? But, but the New York Times does have um, areas that are more in, of more interest to them than, than to another newspaper, for instance. A, a number of our... I think that, uh, do you, what do you think? What do you think, Simon or Pamela? I'll let uh, Pamela, do you want to answer that one as somebody who often writes for the New York Times? Well, I, I was, I was sorry, I was just going to jump in with some comments that people are making uh, in chat, which is that um, so, some people are saying that people, when people who read tabloid newspapers, and maybe even who watch Fox News, might know that a lot of it's not true, but they, it gives them a sense of belonging. And so you can't uh, get them, you can't argue with them because uh, it's, it's, it's more of like a tribal allegiance or a, a kind of club membership. What do you do in that situation, Yulina? And that's extremely tricky. And this is actually the reason why we have not yet started talking to young people about conspiracy theories. Because conspiracy theories, it's not really a matter of fact versus fake, right? In the, in the minds of somebody who believes a conspiracy theory, it's a matter of fact versus fact. You know, it's a hierarchy of facts and they choose the facts that suit their their narrative and it's extremely difficult to unravel and particularly extremely difficult to unravel in a group setting because you know usually when you talk to people about conspiracy theories the ones that are the most quiet um, are the ones that disagree but they won't say because they will be um, afraid of being laughed at um, and that silence can become really toxic and so when you're when you're doing that sort of work and we're thinking about this very very deeply because of the many conspiracy theories that are that are spawning around coronavirus at the moment um, you have to make sure this happens in a group setting or in role play I mean this is really hard it's not a direct answer to your question because you can't do that in a normal mm. environment with adults right but to, to just try and squash it um, as being being untrue or laugh at it is going to be counterproductive, entirely counterproductive. And you're absolutely right. It is belonging. It is belonging. Mm -hmm. And you have to give up something. If you, if you stop believing it, you also have to stop believing your group. And that's a very, very difficult thing to do. Extremely difficult. And this is also why we try so hard. I mean, when we go into classrooms, we try incredibly hard and we tell the teachers to steer, uh, the journalists to steer away from political issues. And we, we work with the shark and we work with you know again the man who married the snake and whatever you know like all sorts of like the childhood was such a genius that he didn't have to go to that he didn't have to go to school anymore Hold on i, I just want to jump in as a working journalist um do whatever you need to do as a mother uh, mm -hmm. writing for the financial times often readers will write or people will comment you made that up you're just lying you're, you're just writing fake news to get people to believe your politics in fact, with the Financial Times or the New York Times or CNN, for example, if you write something that turns out to be incorrect, if you write an inaccuracy, the humiliation is enormous, there's a correction. And if, you, if that happens to you three times in a few weeks, your job is gone. So you do not have the freedom at those kinds of outlets to make factual errors that are, after checking, found to be factual errors. And I think that is a big difference between let's say our type of outlets and something like the Sun or Fox News. Yeah. Of course, there is still bias. There's always bias in anything that anyone writes because you're always selecting which opinions and which set of facts to present. 
So in the 2016 election, do you present the story about Hillary's emails or do you present the story about Trump's sexual assaults? Uh, whichever choice you make, even if you're then telling the story completely factually, is a bias. Yeah. And there are people who say that the New York Times was engaging in anti-Hillary Clinton propaganda in the run-up to the election. You know, there's all sorts of ways of talking about this. Um, and um, as Simon said, that, you know, the, the, the speed at which reporting has to be done is such a breakneck and uh, and the controls that exist for some newspapers don't exist for others and also you have to think about it that you know the ability of a newspaper publisher at times when the business model of journalism is so in such trouble the ability of a published newspaper publisher to identify that a particularly catchy headline is creating you know is, is attracting attention um you know that's that's something very new and for you know for a publisher then or you know an editor then to resist the temptation of engaging in in clickbait um is is really it's quite difficult it's really quite difficult and for journalists as well um and you know and that's why you know when you're facing big important decisions about you know you have to make your mind up about something you know read around it i would say no i mean don't just focus on one piece that you saw once um but actually take time to think about the complexity of the issue and engage with it. It doesn't, you don't need to make a decision, you know, within two minutes, it's worth actually looking left and right. Another big difference is that uh, the, these major newspapers that we're talking about, like the New York Times and the Washington Post have investigative units where they um, have, the, have the resources to put reporters on stories sometimes for months at a time and do a level of leg legwork that a sort of, um, you know, live commentary on Fox News has nothing to do with. I mean, there's a reason why the big prizes go to these newspapers because they do they 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 do these big stories in a way that um, some of the other places we were talking about just just do choose not to cannot do not. Yeah, yeah. And what we try to do, like we we often talk about um, the story of I don't know if you remember the story of Elian Gonzalez, the little Cuban boy who got. Do you remember the one who you know got on a raft in uh, whenever it was. Uh, 2000 um and in the end he was you know you know he left cuba with his mother the, the raft sank his mother died he ended up in miami there was a big court case over whether he should stay with his uh, mother's family or whether his father who was still in cuba it was a huge political issue in the end he was returned to cuba and you know two extremely prestigious um news publications which don't really exist in their current format anymore which is time and newsweek chose radically different front pages for for this story you know one of them showed that you know Elian Gonzalez was being ripped from the arms of his uh, his aunt with you know FBI agents with guns um, and the other one showed him reconciled with his father beaming into the camera and the thing is both of those both of those realities are true you know but often journalists have to choose how they're going to present it because you have only one headline you only have one headline you only have one front cover and which is why it's so important to look beyond the headline and to read around to read you know in a case like that you had to read the newsweek article and the times article the time article and in fact the new york times article which had the the benefit of having both photos together but these are you know decisions that journalists have to do and editors have to make all the time I'm going to use my prerogative, sorry, uh, just, I'm going to quickly go because it's the last class before summer and because I, I work as a journalist. There's an interesting question from Oliver Dungy. How has advertising affected the spread of misinformation? Is there a way to manage that? I would say that for major outlets, we just don't have as much advertising as we used to because advertising shifted massively to Google and Facebook. So if you think of publications like the New York Times or the Washington Post, they don't make their money from ads so much. They make it from subscribers and that's gone up massively. And that creates a different bias, which is you write stories that you think your subscribers will like and you, they like them partly because it agrees with their political views and that creates a whole new set of problems. You're writing things that your readers uh, supports what your readers already believe. Juliana, do you want, would you say yeah. something different on that? Or uh, no, no, I absolutely agree. And I don't want to get into too much technical detail, but here in Brussels, we're gearing up for the publication of some rather hefty regulatory proposals where people are thinking about maybe um, antitrust law needs to be um, interpreted in a new way. Maybe actually consumer safety needs to be, and not just the money, because the really interesting thing about disinformation and especially the social media platforms is um, it's not that they are 
um, taking money from us. They're not, you know, you can't actually say, oh, they're monopolizing, you know, the income from whatever. They're not. They're taking our data and they're taking our attention. Um, and there are there are there is just very very lively discussion happening here in Brussels at the European Commission and the various regulatory authorities about whether one should start thinking about limits to data gathering and the, the gathering of very personal data such as human anger and fear the gathering and marketing of that data um, and whether it shouldn't actually be a case of of attacking this and we call it you know we I, we often talk about the attention economy or the outrage industry and we've been talking very much about the demand side of that right the demand side is like the consumer side of it what can you do what can educators do what can teachers do but on the supply side is it not also time to start thinking about disrupting the business model so that you know and that actually very particularly and answering the you know slightly addressing the the question um very particularly talking about the advertising revenue business model of the social media Media platforms. There's an awful lot of very, very good and interesting um, uh, uh, literature out there as well. And in the US, I know that there's a lot of debate going on about something called Section 230, which is very technical, but bizarrely has got bi bipartisan support a lot of the time. So yes, Juliana, there's an awful lot of things to do. Um, <laughs> thank you very, very much. And Everybody uh, watch out, but don't disbelieve everything you read. Just be suspicious, I think, surely is the message. Thank and you. take your uh, time. <laughs> and take your time. And also think, am I believing this because I want to believe it? Thank you very, very much, Juliana. Um,